Good afternoon again, and welcome to today's webinar titled Implementing the Serene Services Guidance, Tips, Tools, and Technical Assistance for Community-Based Organizations. My name is Farah Najir Kamper, and I serve as the Senior Program Manager for Capaci Capacity Building at AIDS United, and I will be moderating today's webinar. AIDS United works to end the AIDS epidemic in the United States, and we work to do this fulfill this mission through strategic grant making, policy and advocacy, formative research, and capacity building and technical assistance. Today's webinar is jointly organized by our capacity building assistance program called Getting to Zero and our policy and advocacy program. Before I begin, um, I wanted to invite participants to mute the speakers on your computers and use your phones um, to dial in. And also feel free to submit questions in the Q&A pod that you'll see on the screen, um, and we will be sure to address those throughout the webinar. We'll have a brief evaluation at the end of the webinar, and we'll ask you to stay with us to complete that so that we can um, obtain your feedback and, and continue to improve the services that we offer. And I also want to remind you that we'll be recording the webinar and make it available on the AIDS United website in the days ahead. So at the end of the web webinar today, we hope that participants will gain a deeper understanding of the process through which jurisdictions can apply for, um, apply to redirect federal funding support um, uh, to support the Serene Services Program, or SSP, um, that you'll understand the different roles between state, local, tribal health departments, and community-based organizations in the application process, and that you'll obtain some concrete examples of how community-based organizations can use your program data um, and your role in the community as leverage to work with health department counterparts in developing successful discrimination of need applications. The webinar today is organized in three different parts. The first offers an overview of various federal guidance, guidelines on funding of services programs. The second explores the role of community-based organizations in the implementation of SSPs. And the third will feature a panel discussion among community, a, a group of community-based um, organization representatives from Indiana and Washington, D.C. So we have a rich panel of presenters today, beginning with Kiefer Patterson, who will lead us through the first and second parts of the webinar. Kiefer serves as the syringe access policy organizer at AIDS United, and he comes to this work with a deep commitment and um, connection to the harms of the war on drugs. He started doing this work um, in, in community organizing in Michigan, working with LGBTQ student groups to expand non-discrimination policy and address intimate partner violence. And he continued um, into anti-violence, suicide prevention, and homelessness organizing with trans and, and queer communities in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Kiefer, and take us away. Thank you very much, Farah. Um, so as, as Farah mentioned, we're going to go through kind of a brief overview of the federal guidance uh, that was released over the last couple of months. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the nitty-gritty of each guidance document. Since they're available, and with the exception of SAMHSA, each of the funding agencies has released clarifications and, and webinars about those themselves, so I will go over them. Um, and then we're going to talk, um, we're going to talk more focused on what CBOs can do to demonstrate the need either to their own health departments who will be making the applications or to help their health, uh, health departments in those applications demonstrate the need for federal funding for SSPs to the CDC. So just a really brief legislative and regulatory history here. In, in December of 2015, um, the syringe services, uh, the, the ban on federal funding for syringe services was modified a little bit to provide an exception that would allow SSPs to be funded using federal dollars in jurisdictions that are currently experiencing or at risk for experiencing a uh, HIV or hepatitis C epidemic as, it, um, as a consequence of injection drug use. And then um, over the course of the next couple of months, various guidance documents were released from each of the component agencies of the Department of, Human, of Health and Human Services. Uh, demonstrating how their individual grant programming funding can be used in this way. And I just wanted to lay out the process in one slide um, because it is essentially there is a two-step process. And the first is 
a jurisdiction needs to submit and, and uh, receive an acceptance of their eligibility of need application, essentially falling into one of two categories. Either they are currently experiencing an HIV or hepatitis C outbreak as a result of injection drug use, or they're at risk for experiencing an HIV or hepatitis C outbreak. Uh, and it's really important to note that it is the local, state, territorial, or tribal health department are the only people who can make this application happen. They are the ones who contact the CDC for that determination of need. Uh, the CDC then has 30 days to evaluate the request and, and make a decision about whether to approve it or not. Uh, if it is to deny, the jurisdiction can and is encouraged to reapply using the feedback from the CDC, um, by adding additional data to, to get the determination that they need. And then once that has been done, eligible grantees from the CDC, HRSA, and SAMHSA will be able then to request that their program funds be reallocated towards um, SSP services. So the, the Health and Human Services guidance that came out is, uh, is very comprehensive. It is a 22-page document that devotes the vast majority of that space to walking jurisdictions and health departments through the application process. Um, it also lays out the, fun, like the fundamental principles of what a syringe service program funded by the federal government is to include, uh, and very, very squarely frames SSP services in, in the context of an integrated and comprehensive healthcare delivery system. Um, SSPs are expected, when funded by the federal government, to have um, ties and connections to mental health care, medical care, social services. Uh, and what's, what's most exciting for us is that the federal government recognizes the need to fund those linkages. And so the HHS guidance really kind of presents SSPs as this integral part of a broad delivery system of, of services and as a key component in, in linkage to care and linkage to treatment for people who inject drugs. Um, the other piece is that because they devote so much, they devote so much time in the, in the document to highlighting all of the different um, areas that health departments can use to justify particularly the at-risk category. And so if, if in a jurisdiction is experiencing a increase in HIV and hepatitis C, assuming the surveillance is there, this should be fairly easy to demonstrate. And so uh, really the, the document spends a significant amount of time highlighting ways and data sets that can be used to, to frame the argument that a jurisdiction is on the verge of experiencing one of these outbreaks. And this includes everything from arrest records, overdose data from hospitals, it includes everything from um, you know, shifts in, in drug use amongst clients, um, and I strongly encourage uh, individuals to, to go through the document and look at all of the different examples of, of resources and reporting mechanisms that you could use to capture some of this. Uh, and this is also, as I'll get into later, where I think uh, many CBOs own program data could be useful in, in the determination of need process. Um, but it, it very much feels like from the guidance that the Health and Human Services, Health and Human Services is trying very difficult to, or very very hard to make this funding as widely available as possible and to ease the application process as much as possible. So while there is a two-step application process and it does require that it goes through the health department because that's how essentially the underlying law was written, it is as easy as possible in that context. And then each, um, each of the component agencies then release their own guidance for their specific programming. Um, and firstly, with HRSA, the, the process is, is very easy. HRSA for FY16 has said that all of their grants, all funding from HRSA is available for this reallocation. That may not be the case in FY17, uh, but all new RFPs starting in FY17 will indicate their eligibility to be used to support SSP programs. Uh, and the process is, is fairly loose in HRSA's instance, besides the determination of need letter from the CDC that uh, a jurisdiction would get were it determined eligible. 
Uh, HRSA requires a letter from the state health officer or county health officer uh, for the area in which an SSP would be operating, basically stating that it's operating within the law, and that, um, and then there may be additional requirements from individual program officers, but the, the guidance, the only listed uh, requirements in the guidance is the determination of need letter and a letter from the local health, the local health officer. And it is worth noting that Ryan White funding has been identified in a FAQ HRSA release alongside their guidance as eligible for use in funding SSP programs. And they list some examples of, of what kind of services uh, Ryan White funds could go towards in the context of an SSP. And this includes things like outreach, linkage and referral services, medical and non-medical case management, substance abuse services, mental health services, and any services connected to early intervention, early intervention programs. And it also mentions that uh, Ryan White grantees may consider stationing or satelliting staff in an SSP uh, to serve that, get that bridge between potentially a community-based organization who is doing certain services programming and a federally qualified health center or an aid service organization. The CDC guidance is a little more concrete in its application process, um, but before I even get into that, I want to acknowledge that there are, there are only two FOAs for FY16 that the CDC has identified as usable in this way. Uh, and the first FOA and the largest funding source through the CDC, PS12-1201, uh, is the large health department grant given to do high impact prevention. Uh, it exclusively goes through the health department. And so in this context, CDOs are not able to directly speak to CDC project officers because the, the grantee in this case is actually the state or local health department um, who then grants, re-grants and works with CBOs. So this is an uh, underscores again how important it is that CBOs looking to engage in SSP activities have a working relationship with their health department because a significant portion of funding that is now available for uh, federal funding for SSPs is going to come through these grants that are administered directly from and through the health departments. And PS14004 is a very small H HCV prevention and treatment grant that's only given to two grantees uh, when it is already largely underfunded, uh, and representatives from those grantees have uh, spoken out about the, the what they're basically their inability to realistically divert funds from their programming, which is already struggling, to go towards SSP programming. And so, in FY17, all new FOAs will include eligibility information, and it's certainly our hope at Age United that more grants from the CDC open up as eligible for SSP funding. And then SAMHSA released their guidance recently, uh, early, early this month, and so far there have not been, uh, they haven't held a webinar to discuss it, there's no FAQ or clarifications. And within that guidance, there's a couple of things that is, that is exciting. One is that um, the grants determined eligible for use as, for an SSP program through SAMHSA include the SABG block grants, so the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grants. Um, barring, of course, their, their mandatory uh, funding requirements around prevention or early education, uh, as well as a five, about five um, capacity building grants aimed at uh, expanding HIV care and treatment in a variety of substance use contexts, and the Minority AIDS Initiative Continuum of Care Grant. That said, um, in the requirements for that you would have to use to justify to SAMHSA diverting those funds, they do list out that on top of the determination of need, you would need to include data providing an increase in hepatitis or HIV infection. Uh, and it's, there's no written provision that, that leaves open the possibility of, of uh, jurisdiction that is at risk for an outbreak but not yet experiencing one to divert SAMHSA funding. And so it's not clear if 
that requirement is hard set in stone or if, if SAMHSA funds will be available for at-risk jurisdictions. But it's worth noting that the, the underlying intent of the legislation is to allow for at-risk jurisdictions. Um, and we will be working with SAMHSA in the next couple of months to get clarity on that. Um, the other thing to note with the SAMHSA guidance and with, with the inclusion of the block grant is that the federal government has opened up a very large pot of money to be diverted towards SSP programming. And so it is, it is, we're very excited that the block grants are available for this, and, and we're going to be working very closely with the administration and the new administration coming in the coming year to uh, get that get that money rolling out as quickly as possible. Um, and before I go any further, I, I do want to stop and make a point, however, that all of this funding is reallocated pre-existing funding. And so while from the perspective of, of an SSP program, there's a, a large volume of funding that is now available, potentially available for the first time, we are diverting funds from other critical prevention programs. And so there are likely many states and jurisdictions who are going to need some assistance finding ways to balance the need for SSP programming and the loss of funding for things like early intervention testing or things like linkage to care because uh, without additional dedicated funds, um, we are essentially stealing from Paul to pay Peter. Uh, and I just would like to take a second. Um, since it appears some folks are not as familiar with various alphabet soup letters. Um, so in this context, SSP, syringe services program, a needle exchange program is the language the federal government has decided to use for syringe exchange programs. And the various SAMHSA, HHS, CDC, so um, SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Administration, um, CDC is the Center for Disease Control, HRSA is the Health Resources Services Administration, and Health and Human Services, which is the parent organization of all of these. These are the federal funding agencies through which um, all, of this, all of these new federal dollars have become available to SSP programming, to syringe exchange programs. So given that health departments are the only um, entities that can initiate a determination of need application. And in the case of, of agencies like the CDC, they are the primary grantees who would have access to funding. Now, what is the role of CBOs in this process? And, and really, in my mind, CBOs are the canaries in the, in the coal mine. Even if you're not currently providing SSP services, if you're serving injection drug users, if you're serving people who use drugs, low-income people, homeless folk, it's likely that you are seeing the impact of the opiate epidemic in the United States more quickly and more readily than, than people at your health department. And your able, the CDC has said over and over that CBOs are well positioned, positioned to justify the need and that your program data is possibly the strongest data within your jurisdiction that can be used to demonstrate how important it is that SSP services be fundable through the, through the federal government. And so really, the takeaway from here is that um, I would really love for you all to be thinking about how can, our, how can our program data and the program data we're already collecting or the program data we could be collecting, how could that be used to justify the need for a syringe exchange program in, in our jurisdiction? And so some examples of what might, what program data you may be collecting that could be used in this way, right? So of course, in increased HIV and HCV um, rates amongst people who inject drugs or amongst their partners, um, increased initiation of injection drug use. So you know, in, we see a lot of folks moving from snorting, um, snorting prescription opiates and doing either injecting them or injecting heroin, or so increased initiation rates. Um, Obviously, if, you, if you're serving HIV or hepatitis C positive clients, if you see trends as more and more of those clients are engaging in drug use, this could be something that could be used. 
um, as well as demographic shifts among who is injecting and uptake in new injectors or young injectors, particularly people who do not have uh, experience injecting uh, in ways that reduce risk, um, shift in the substance use behavior, so moving from uh, injecting uh, once a day to frequently um, increase demand for substance use treatment and referrals if you're sending them out or if you're a substance use provider, if you're seeing an uptake in, in people demand, in demanding your services. If you're currently doing syringe exchange in the United States and you're seeing increased demand for uh, for needles, and particularly, um, I think, different kinds of needles that might get to different injecting communities are now accessing your services. This could be useful. As well, of course, increased reported overdoses and dem demand for naloxone. And uh, the CDC held two webinars to go through their guidance and the, the HAS determination of need guidance. And in those webinars, CDC officials explicitly kind of talked about um, current syringe exchange providers who uh, are may, may be working in an environment where HIV and hepatitis C rates amongst injection drug users have gone down as a result of the presence of syringe exchange services but are seeing a, a significant uptick in demand for needles and for more and more needles. That could be a warning sign, right, that there is, there is a pocket of the community that is not being served and if we don't scale up the SSP services in that area, we could be vulnerable to an, uh, to an outbreak. And so um, all of these things could, could be used uh, to help justify the determination of need. And so there's some things that you could start thinking about and, and ways you could start thinking about collecting data that might be useful as we move forward. Um, and certainly, I think, Individuals who are serving clients at every level of the agency ha have a role here. So, you know, your outreach teams, your case managers, medical providers, um, all should be looking at the work that they're doing and thinking about it in in how can this work capture the need for uh, for these syringe exchange services. Uh, and some ways to do that is to you know start increasing screening for substance use if you're not already if you're an agency that is serving. Um, populations impacted by substance use but are not specifically an agency serving um, drug users, you know, consider increasing the amount of screening and time you devote to talking about substance use amongst your clients. Uh, for clients who uh, are using drugs and are connected to a case, uh, case manager, I certainly encourage case managers to keep detailed track of risk behaviors amongst those clients, whether that's through, you know, case management software, whether that's through the homelessness management information system um, or just regular case notes and Excel spreadsheets, you know, really start trying to track this stuff. Uh, certainly, uh, I would encourage you all to use social networking strategies to reach high-risk populations of people who inject drugs. Um, you know, not only, don't just serve the person sitting in front of you, but ask them about their friends. Ask them about, you know, do you know of other people who, who need to be connected to services? The, do you know of folks who aren't coming in? And if all possible, you know, use peer navigators to help reach those populations. Um, and for those already engaging in syringe distribution, <coughs> consider scaling up data collection at that point of distribution. So I know that with syringe exchange programs, there's a constant struggle between uh, how do we collect data to justify the success of the program and, and to track trends versus make it as low barrier as possible so it doesn't impact our ability to do the syringe distribution. Um, and so I'm, I'm cognizant of that, but really I, I would encourage syringe exchange programs that are already doing uh, distribution to, to start collecting as much demographic data as possible so that you can track changes that might be used to justify federal funding. Um, and of course, thinking about things like wound care referrals or um, any, any referrals your agency is making or receiving that, that could be linked to injection drug use. The other piece is that CBOs are going to have to build partnerships and, and potentially get, engage in some advocacy. The reality of uh, health departments playing both the role of facilitators but also potentially gatekeepers to federal funds means that it's going to take strong partnerships with your, your local health departments to, to gain access to this funding. And I think that CBOs should be intentional about building those relationships now. Um, 
it's also going to be helpful, I think, given the framing of the HHS guidance and, and what a really funded the SS syringe services program is, would be it's really important to think of these programs in the context of an integrated service delivery system and, and as much as possible be building those relationships now. Not only does that increase the amount of data collection that you as a CBO have some control over rather than simply relying on surveillance, state surveillance systems, uh, but it also demonstrates capacity to implement the program, uh, which could be helpful both at local level and, and advocating to the health, your health department, as well as advocating at the federal level to get that funding. And then consider building allies with key stakeholders, both government and community. Um, in particular, every piece of uh, federal guidance talks about the need for law enforcement buy-in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would strongly encourage organizations to start building relationships with local law enforcement. And there, there are a couple of examples of, of this being done really well in places like North Carolina, um, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, in Seattle, in Arlington, uh, places that are running uh, law enforcement system diversion programs. Uh, there's, there's definitely models out there, but having law enforcement in, in support of SSP programs will go a long way towards easing uh, both implementation of those programs, which funding is, is obtained, as well as obtaining that funding. And then, of course, you know, my, I come from a background of community organizing, and so thinking about who, who locally has control of the decision to apply or not, right? So um, besides trying to build relationships directly with state health officers, you know, or having relationships with the legislators that sit on relevant committees, um, behavioral health officials who are going to be pretty central in getting any of the state block grant money from SAMHSA to be used to fund SSC services. Um, if you could find a champion in the executive's office, that would be incredibly helpful. And the same is true in the community. Uh, SSP programming is, is fairly controversial, and there's often been initial resistance from the community, and sometimes after an SSP has run for some time, right, that resistance goes away and people realize it is, is broadly beneficial. But uh, as much as possible, if you could just deal with that before it's even a problem, that would be for the best. And so consider uh, incorporating or building a coalition of faith groups, businesses, educational partners, uh, homeless advocacy groups, I think, in many places are often overlooked because certain services programs are always viewed kind of in this context of infectious disease prevention. But since we know that uh, injection drug use is so closely tied with becoming homeless or maintaining homelessness, consider working with local homelessness advocacy organizations on this issue. Uh, and the last piece I want to say is, is engage in legislative advocacy. And I know that's something that's very scary for the 501c3s, but 501c3 organizations can engage in legislative and none of this federal funding is going to be available in jurisdictions where syringe service programs are illegal. Uh, and further, a lot of states legalizing syringe services programs, they, they tie that legalization to a lot of unnecessary restrictions, like one-for-one -one exchange rates. And so even if SSP services are legal in your jurisdiction, uh, working to strengthen that, that right uh, is something that I think service providers are really well equipped to do. Um, and, and C3 organizations are able to engage in legislative advocacy um, and even, even lobbying. And if, if that is particularly concerning um, or if you want to figure out how to navigate that, uh, Alliance for Justice has a lot of resources for CBOs looking to engage in this. And, and actually on July 14th, Age United will be hosting a webinar, which I believe we have a slide for in a, in a little later, talking through the the role CBOs can play in, in legislative and electoral and civic engagement kind of situations. And so don't be afraid of advocacy. Uh, it, it, the HIV movement has, has in large part been built on the backs of service organizations. And I think that this is something that we can absolutely take into, into advocating for harm reduction services uh, and overdose prevention services and to help us deal with this epidemic. Thank you, Kiefer. Before we continue, there are um, a few questions, and I think now is an appropriate time for, for
for us to address. First, we want to let everyone know that, yes, we will be sharing the slides with you, and we'll be sure to include an acronym um, slide so that we can really clarify that. We also have a few questions that I think it's um, where you can respond to. One from Jason Rivera, who asks, can a county health department also apply, even if it doesn't have the support from the state health department? Absolutely. Uh, the CDC jurisdiction is defined by the CDC can be as small as a city and, and as large as the whole state. Um, and so if, your, if the structure of your state health department system is such that a, a local jurisdictional health department is able to do that um, without having to go through the state health department, that's absolutely an option. Uh, the CDC does encourage jurisdictions to apply as, lar as large a jurisdiction as possible. Um, because if you're using just a county health department, for example, uh, it, you're going to have to justify the federal funding for an FSP using just that county's data um, and, and maybe neighboring counties. You, you, if you were doing across the entire state, for example, you'd have a broader data set to work with. But yes, absolutely, local, local health departments are able to apply. It just has to come from a health department. Um, and Savannah asks, if um, HHS, Health and Human Services, HRSA, CDC are all different avenues for funding or whether they must all be solicited jointly to be eligible? They are all different avenues. Um, the only unifying step is that first step in the process is, is getting that determination of need. But after that's been done, um, you can, uh, it, well, oftentimes you can't. Uh, health departments can uh, apply directly to an individual funding agency for their individual funding stream. Um, the, the only necessary required step is the, the first determination of need. I think we'll, we'll address two more questions before we move on. One from James who asks whether for those of us who are in states like North Carolina where FSPs are currently legal, can we access federal funds? Uh, no. So uh, one of the requirements for federal funded SSPs are that they be uh, legal in the state and operating in accordance to a state's law. So even if they are legal, you also need to be staying within that legalization. Uh, there, there may be other assistance from places like the Harm Reduction Coalition or, or even here at AIDS United to help get you to the point where it is legal in your state and you can be applying for federal funding. Erin Aaron says that in Maryland, the Department of Health has already applied to the CDC and has been approved as a jurisdiction of need, um, and is asking whether the next step should be to notify the CBOs in the state about the approval, um, and is also interested in knowing what information CBOs might need from um, DHMH to move forward, Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, to move forward with reallocating or applying for federal funding. Um, so. Definitely, I would say um, if, if the state health department has already gotten their determination, yes, that, that should be disseminated as widely as possible so advocates and activists and people interested in, in starting an FSP or expanding one can do so. Um, ultimately, the CBOs are going to have to work pretty closely with, with the health department. Um, when looking at the CDC funding, for example, it's all going to come through the health department. Um, and so it, it could be that what needs to happen is just a, a meeting between interested CPOs and, and the health department or for organizations, for example, who are Ryan White pro providers, um, they should start talking to their, their program officers. And this is the last question we'll take before we move on, but we'll, we'll be sure to address others that come in as well, ones that we haven't gotten to so far. Um, can you give a little bit more detail about the determination of need? What needs to be in it and who has to do it? So, Kiefer, if you can touch Absolutely. on that again. Uh, yes, yeah, so the determination of need being the first step in this process. Um, the, the only agency or entity that can submit the application to the CDC is the state health department, but uh, others could be involved locally in putting it together and providing data for it. Um, and the, I would, I, the CDC hosted a webinar that, that devoted two and a half hours specifically to the determination of the process, and I would strongly encourage you all to look at that, and it will be included in the resources at the end of the webinar. But essentially, the determination of need process needs to either show uh, an increase in HIV and hepatitis C rates uh, as a result of injection drug use, so this would come from, from surveillance data, 
or you need to justify that a jurisdiction is at risk, and that can include all kinds of different different data. Um, and so I would I would encourage you all just to go into the HHS guidance because specifically that first piece of guidance, the the overarching determination of need guidance, devotes significant time to laying this process out as easy as and to, to linking to places where you might be able to find data, to providing examples, as well as putting together um, to putting together like two mock applications um, and, and, and walking through how this application is a strong one in, in getting a at-risk or um, currently experiencing determination. All right. Thank you, Kiefer. That was a thorough overview of the federal guidelines as well as a, an exploration of the different roles that CBOs can play um, in supporting their local health departments in the declaration of need um, process. Amber Roberts um, is with us. She's the Capacity Building Manager at the Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and Emma will facilitate the panel discussion featuring CBO panelists and um, partners from around the country. Emma and HRC are key partners in AIDS United's cap Capacity Building Program. Emma has worked for the Harm Reduction Coalition since 2009, and her focus is to provide technical assistance and support to programs promoting syringe access, drug user health, hepatitis C services, and overdose prevention. Welcome, Emma. Thank you, Farah, and thank you for inviting me to help facilitate this discussion today. Um, um, it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce the panelists that we have today because all three of them have worked very closely um, with the Harm Reduction Coalition um, and collaborated with us in the past as part of our training and technical assistance and advocacy activities. Um, Cindy Clay is the Executive Director for HIPS based in DC. They're an organization that assists individuals engaging in sex work to lead healthy lives. Um, and um, Cindy's and the HIPS booth is one of the favorite booths at our HRC conference that's held every two years. Uh, the next conference being um, in San Diego in November. So if you're interested in attending, please check our website and also make sure you visit Cindy's booth because it's always really interesting. Um, Cindy is an internationally recognized expert with over 20 years of experience in program development, uh, nonprofit management, and evaluation for improving the health and safety of both injection and non-injection drug users, sex workers, and transgender individuals. Um, our um, second uh, panelist is Chris a Abert, who's the director of Indiana Recovery Alliance. Chris is also a social worker. Uh, he's worked with people who use drugs in numerous capacities for the last 12 years. Um, most recently in uh, the capacity of founding a low barrier harm reduction project in southern Indiana based out of Bloomington but also assisting um, some other counties in Indiana. Uh, and then Dr. Carrie Lawrence also based in Indiana um, as part of Project Cultivate. She's a practitioner, an academic and public health advocate with several years of practice and experience in non-for-profit and social services and her applied research examines social um, address examine social justice, health disparities and inequalities, and empowering communities to collectively act upon their own health priorities to inform program and service design, as well as development um, and public health policy. Um, most recently, Carrie, through her work at Project Cultivate, has been instrumental in providing networking opportunities for counties and health departments and CBOs across Indiana in the, in the wake of the um, HIV outbreak in Austin. Um, so we're really glad to have all three. Um, and so I want to start off by asking um, Carrie and Chris, um, the situation in Indiana from early last year when we first heard about the outbreak of HIV in Scott County, um, it developed very rapidly. And the implementation of, uh, implementation of syringe exchange was a part of the crisis response at that time, which but to some extent, it's not always necess uh, necessarily ideal when we're thinking about prevention work. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a reaction to the crisis. Um, were there challenges in attempting to uh, rapidly implement syringe access services in this environment um, of, of the, you know, this very localized epidemic, or in coordinating the response between local CBOs and government stakeholders? Uh, Maybe carry or. Yeah, Chris, do you want to start? Yeah, this is Chris with the Indiana Recovery Alliance. Thank you, everybody, uh, 
for the information and for uh, hosting the panel. We um, we think it's a good lesson for the rest of the country um, that's at risk, that it is uh, difficult to respond to a crisis rather than uh, having a preventative network already in place. Um, the, the, it feels like the major challenge was time. Uh, it takes time to coordinate agencies to meet. Uh, it takes time to get letters uh, together in order to move forward with the SAP. It takes time to get police to sit down at the table if they're even willing to sit down at the table. It takes time to have public hearings. Um, so yeah, and gathering all of the information about overdose rates and hepatitis C rates. Uh, and luckily in our county, a lot of that information was already available, but even putting it together um, in a single format and finding the people that are able to do that uh, to justify the need for an FSP. Um, we, uh, we also had to show, specifically in Indiana, that other efforts had been attempted. So we had to outline other efforts to address the hepatitis C epidemic uh, and for HIV prevention work. Um, what I think, though, more importantly, uh, funding was very difficult. Uh, there was no funding. And I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to the, singing to the choir here. Um, but it was helpful. Some in some areas, we were able to get immediate funding. Uh, there were low barrier grants available through Broadway Cares. And by low barrier, I mean one page uh, to fill out. Uh, that didn't have requirements for us that have already been in existence for three years. There was money made available through Age United, of course, uh, statewide. Uh, micro grants through the North American Syringe Exchange Network. Um, and another thing that was actually helpful in coordinating uh, the response with government stakeholders is is having been through training through HRC uh, so that we could go in and talk about harm reduction and, and how reasonable um, not only a, to have that as a response, harm reduction, uh, but also as prevention. So that was, that was very helpful. Um, I think just to, to give a little bit of my perspective, um, and Chris mentioned, I think, uh, a key point is the, the fact that um, resources of any type really were not available for the state. However, they have um, kind of a stronghold on the governance and of our local um, <coughs> syringe services programs. Um, and so and it can be a major challenge of that is that 70% of the counties in Indiana are considered rural, even though the majority of our populations are in two kind of more metropolitan areas, um, which means that because the state was not going to provide any type of resources in relation to the programming costs, or nor the planning costs of the health departments, because they're kind of the the local health departments are the the, the guide, or I guess the they're the local um, entity or institution that has to own this. Um, and so as a result, we have counties that have maybe a, a part-time health director and two part-time staff who are doing um, only birth, search, birth and death certificates and vaccine, vaccinations. Um, so even just the human capital putting the um, proposal for the state together, but even attempting to construct what their their local kind of efforts were going to be, or their programming needs will uh, the resources related to their their programming needs was an is an ongoing challenge, um, and so just kind of recognizing this was a new role for local health departments, um, and my. My background is an academic, but also similar to Chris, I have about 16 years in a variety of social service agencies. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, there's a huge learning curve, um, as well as just kind of deciding whether or not they want to put forth the effort um, and time um, and how they were, I guess, basically build it with scotch tape and Elmer's glue and popsicle sticks. Um, given the lack of resources that have been made available or really any clear guidance because um, the guidance provided by our health department 
um, maybe makes sense to some, but not to everyone. So even interpreting how this needed to work um, has been an ongoing challenge. However, the common narrative since last year has been we don't want to be another Scott County. Um, however, the resources to make the case to the State Department of Health as to why we need this at a local level has been an ongoing barrier as well. If I could add quickly also, without the help of other uh, already established SSPs, we absolutely couldn't have done this. Uh, everything from needing uh, policies and procedures to actual um, supplies, uh, know-how, previous uh, participant input, we got all that from mostly from the Chicago Recovery Alliance, but also from Denver Harm Reduction Coalition, People's Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, without that input, we wouldn't be where we are now. Thank you. Um, so just as a follow-on to that, the emergency authorization in Indiana required an approval process through the local health department, which is very similar to the system that's been designed by CDC for accessing federal funding. Um, how was the rollout process? Um, were the challenges that differed between health departments? And I know, Carrie, you've worked with a range of health departments. And any examples of key decisions or approaches or collaborations that eased that process that perhaps you haven't already mentioned in the prior question? Right. So the, so the first and foremost thing after deciding we're going to try to move this, this effort forward is that the health, the health officer um, and we actually, I know that some states are not like this, but we actually have a county health department in every, all 92 counties, and there are a couple of counties with two health departments, one being in Gary, Indiana, and the other in Indianapolis. Um, and so, you know, there are these individual institutions. It's not like they have to go across county lines and some of the jurisdictional issues that I know sometimes arise. But the health officer has to claim an epidemic of, HIV or hepatitis C. Now that poses the first issue um, because in thinking about what, defining what an epidemic is and what that means to both the local level as well as the state interpretation has been an ongoing <laughs> and grueling um, situation because of there, there's not a lot of resources in relation to testing um, to feel like, I mean, a lot of health officers are saying, well, in order for me to really make even just a local case to my, uh, the local, the community itself, I feel like I, feel like ne I need to have an actual, to be able to sh demonstrate that. Um, and so, and given that the fact that our epi data is somewhat lagged and even attempting to get that information from the state has been a huge challenge and to put that into context, I helped the county put a request in, oh, I would say it's now going on five months ago and they've still yet to hear anything back. Um, and what the, the state has posted is, you know, a, a year later and, and for the, the individual perceptions of what they need to make their case locally, they want, it would be great to have that information real time. Um, and so, and granted, they have to kind of get the local, the, it has to start at a local level first. I mean, they have to develop this proposal, and then they have to get um, approval from their county commissioners and the local health board, um, and then move it up to the state. So there's a lot of preparation and time really going in just the construction of the proposal and building that case. Um, so even, so the kind of, at least for the smaller counties, feeling the need they have to justify the epidemic by their numbers. And maybe their numbers, because of the population, is not very high. But even attempting to, to spin off that into prevalence rates where it may seem more like an urge, urgent need, they're still not confident. So one of the, the barriers even to feel like to build the efficacy has in, the ability to increase testing. Um, and even though we have some amazing aid service organizations um, that are willing to test, obtaining the test, and, and again, feeling like they have enough um, 
their numbers are enough to make a, a local case to, to start off with. As, and then also, I think, as Chris mentioned, really being able to get the right people around the table um, as well because of, I mean, the, I would say the largest opposition during, the part, during our syringe exchange legislation was the prosecutors, you know, so the state prosecutors were pretty much opposed um, to any, even our legislation moving forward being part of, you know, as a witness of the policy process. Um, so I think, I think that is something um, that continues to be a, a huge challenge in, in our state, um, yet not doing anything is not going to help either. So um, I think in the 24 counties plus that I've been working with, through, mostly through the health departments around the state, this is just an ongoing, it's, it's, it's a marathon that just keeps going. <laughs> And I, I mean, just to chip in there, this, um, I suppose this also speaks to um, Kiefer's earlier slides in terms of the guidance that we've been given here um, for reallocation of federal funding is to perhaps also be looking for additional data points um, that can be collected. And in some areas, you know, some programs have been able to collaborate with their local hospitals to get um, ER rates for admission for, say, abscesses or it's seeing elevated rates of endocarditis as a result of injection drug use. So there's other data points that people have been able to pull together to show determination of need in other ways, um, given the challenges that Carrie just outlined. Chris, is there anything you'd want to add to that question before I move on? Uh, no, I think Carrie covered it, covered it thoroughly. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, next question is for Cindy. Um, Cindy, HIPS has been around for like more than 20 years, um, and they started to do syringe exchange in perhaps the last decade, you know, in the last nine or ten years. Um, and syringe exchange itself actually in D.C. predated HIPS actually entry into the provision of those services. Um, did your approach to working with the health department have to shift or change dramatically at all when you took on um, this as new work? Uh, and what was that like? What was it like? What was it like incorporating syringe access into your range of existing services? Um, how easy was that? Um, you know, what kind of things did you do to make that seamless, or what, what, what were the challenges you had to address? Right. Thank you. Um, so HIPS was somewhat unique. Um, and I think we were in a, in, a, in a unique place, but one that um, other organizations potentially could, could identify with is we were a harm reduction program working from a harm reduction perspective for, you know, 15 years before we ever actually did syringe exchange. Um, and part of that was because there was an active and, you know, there was an active syringe exchange that was working in the city. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the situation in D.C., um, we don't have control over our own budget, and so Congress had put waivers in our budget saying that not only could D.C. not use, you know, no one could use federal funds, but up until 2007, D.C. couldn't even use our own local state dollars to fund syringe exchange services. So HIPS worked in collaboration with that organization called Prevention Works, which existed entirely on private funding. Um, it's not unlike, you know, probably in other areas of the country where you have small privately funded syringe exchanges and or underground exchanges. Um, and then when that rider was lifted and we were able to use our state funds, the D.C. government um, worked on expanding syringe access. Um, and HIPS was one of the programs um, that, that wanted to, to get involved. And primarily because we didn't want to duplicate the services that Prevention Works was doing, what we did was we were going to um, integrate syringe exchange into our current programming. And we had been working with the health department for many, many years, pretty much the entirety of our history, on doing other kinds of programs for non-injection drug users serving primarily sex, work sex workers, women, um, trans women, and men who, at, who were at high risk for HIV infection. Um, and we wanted to, you know, integrate syringe exchange into our activities that we were already doing and run um, what we wanted to be originally was kind of a smaller, more of a boutique exchange that 
like filled in gaps in services that were existing for injection users. For example, um, we were really going to target and work with the trans community because we had cultural competency around hormone and silicone injection and not just um, drug injection. Um, and then also work with women who we know traditionally um, are not major users of syringe exchanges across the country because syringe exchanges primarily tend to be very male dominated. Um, we wanted to set up um, delivery services which made syringe exchange more available for people. Um, and we wanted to kind of do things that other larger exchanges weren't doing. Um, and then when Prevention Works closed in, um, unfortunately closed, we found that a lot of their clients ended up coming to us and our syringe exchange grew significantly after that. So some of the challenges, even as a harm reduction organization, um, we were trying to get our program up and running rather quickly and with our existing staff as opposed to being able to hire new staff. Um, and so even as an organization that had been doing really good um, cutting edge harm reduction um, education to drug users, um, it was very challenging at the beginning to have well-meaning and, you know, very well-informed staff trying to set up a syringe exchange program who had never injected drugs before. And so we had a couple of false starts with even, like, getting policies together and getting the program off the ground because we didn't, we weren't able to immediately build in the capacity to hire injection, to hire current injection drug users into the program. And it took us a little bit of time to get that through. And once we kind of got that happening, and, and we have a very active secondary program that is, you know, is responsible for the majority of the syringes we actually exchange and gets a lot of our work out there into the community, um, that was really kind of a, a lesson. It was a lesson that without having that expertise in-house already because most of our most of our clients and most of our peers and the people that we work with and our, and our staff were non-injection users maybe sex workers maybe drug users but non-injection and it's a you know it's a it was a it was a couple, um, cultural competency that we had to slowly grow even though we were good at harm reduction um, I think that the other challenges that we had when we were building the program were that um, we were now kind of in, we were bringing in a new population of people into our drop-in center, into our programming, and, you know, we kind of had to help our current community, sex workers, primarily sex workers, women, and trans people, um, kind of like acknowledging and understanding the shift in our focus. Um, because of the success of our syringe exchange program and because of the success or and because of the prevention of uh, the closure of prevention works we actually expanded our mission to kind of acknowledge that while we had been serving you know drug users who did not do sex work for many many years they weren't part of our primary target population and so we also kind of had to do an organizational shift in focus and I and I want to um, I want to piggyback on what the earlier speaker said about really utilizing and having the assistance of the harm reduction community both in DC um, but also nationally like we had the same support as far as people helping us like get our policies and procedures together and you know answering kind of the, the basic questions that you're going to have I think of, of or you know I guess of communities that are willing to literally just give you their program, you know, like here's all the information you need to do to start up a program exactly like mine in your city. The harm reduction community is really good about that. Um, and so luckily we had a lot of technical assistance and we were able to hire consultants, you know, who, who like at a certain point in the programming like came in and helped us get things started. And that's what that I can't emphasize how important it is to find that and utilize it when you're trying to set a program up. Thanks, Cindy. And I think that's such a great point. And that's certainly um, been our experience as the National Harm Reduction Coalition in that as areas of the country are beginning to start programs and are very new to this, we've done a lot of that of being able to connect people to other parts of the country that may be in similar working environments. And people have been so generous and supportive in sharing budgets and policies and practices and answering questions and, you know, shaping people's approaches to meet the needs in their local communities. That's such a good point. And if people are looking for that 
kind of information if you're on the webinar, please feel free to reach out to the Harm Reduction Coalition. To, for, to, we can certainly connect you to, to those people that can be across the country within the harm reduction community can be supportive. And I also really appreciate Cindy's you know, description of what they went through as an organization, because I'm sure there's many CBOs on this webinar now that are currently doing wonderful services, you know, whether it be aid service organizations or prevention services or harm reduction services for their communities, and are seeing these trends in drug use and are, want, and are beginning to think about, well, how do we meet those needs now, and how do we incorporate things like syringe access services into our program? So I think it's a really wonderful framing of, you know, the kind of things to think about as you move forward with that. Um, the next question I'm going to move to, we're going to have a couple more questions before we open up to full Q&A, um, is um, for Chris. Chris, what role did community activists and CBOs play in, model, in molding the local imp imp implementation of syringe access in Indiana? And were they consulted beforehand, or were they placed in a situation where they had to react to a plan designed solely by the state? Um, was their involvement, if they were involved, helpful in moving the final product forward? So I, I wonder if you could speak to that from your experience in Indiana. Sure. So we were lucky in, in a sense that prior to the HIV outbreak, community members on their own had already gotten together to discuss the viability of syringe access um, in our county and in southern Indiana due to the, the risk that we knew was there. Um, so this was a, a group of social workers. There was our local HIV care coordinators. There was just concerned community members. Um, and a lot of progress was made. Uh, we, as you know, got together with Harm Reduction Coalition and made surveys to put out to participants uh, to ask what their needs were and where they felt comfortable um, meeting if there were a syringe access program. So right from the beginning, uh, it was community driven and it was participant focused, understanding how important it is to have participants like really guiding the program um, because they are the experts uh, and they do they know what they need and they know where they need it. Um, so that was that was huge. Uh, we also had the benefit of um, an underground needle exchange operating called the Bloomington. Uh, outreach projects. Uh, and that happened, I believe, a immediately when the outbreak was declared. Um, so we worked closely with them, uh, not only because they had built rapport, which is incredibly important and, again, a time-consuming effort, uh, but we worked really closely with them and then incorporated a lot of those volunteers directly into the Indiana Recovery Alliance. Um, once we had permission from the state uh, to do a needle exchange. Uh, so it was essential. It gave us rapport. It gave us insight. Uh, and having, you know, going, moving forward and talking to other uh, policymakers and government institutions and really stressing the importance of this being a bottom-up uh, organization, because that's not typically the way organizations in social services are, are structured. Um, so I think in all those ways, it was, it was incredibly important to have uh, the community and uh, you know, people who are using inject injectable drugs, uh, not only at the table, but at the table before anybody else was at the table. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, you make such a good point there. And again, you know, in, from our work at a national level, some of, and and you know, programs like Cindy's Hips program in DC, really, you know, being really genuine to involve in participants and gaining that knowledge that you talked about and engaging them in the process of development has been one of the key factors in make in successful programming around this. Um, and definitely, if you're on the webinar and you're thinking about this find out if there's underground exchange going on, as Chris pointed out. If, it, if it's already going on in your area, that's a great resource to tap into, to get information, to get data, to also inform you on the needs of people in your local area in terms of moving forward to developing more overground um, services. Um, so the next question before we open up to Q, well, before I actually give people a chance to sum up, um, Cindy, can you talk about um, the role that HIPS has taken in working with health departments to shape the local syringe access policy? Um, also including things like, you know, DC normally has a one-for-one -one policy of distribution. That's where people bring back 
a certain number of syringes and they get the same number back versus in other areas of the country where it's more needs based and people can just ask what they want, um, which tends to run count, you know, the one for one policy tends to run counter to what we harm reduction philosophy says is good practice. Um, and how has HIPS been have to navigate that in order to meet the needs of participants whilst maintaining a working relationship with the health department? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, yes, I think that um, one thing that we have learned, I mean, HIPS is no stranger and has been no stranger over the course of our 20 years in both kind of being, you know, a, a friend and an ally and a, and a worker with the health department and then also acknowledging that we need to make sure we have enough autonomy from them, even though they are one of our funders, that we can tell them when they screw up um, or when they're screwing up. and. Uh, luckily, we have that's a, that's a game that we have been playing and a dance that we've been having with them for pretty much our entire history. So, um, for us, like good and like good communication has been super important. Um, regular communication. I made a I personally made it um, a priority for me to join the the community planning group, um, which is now the prevention planning group. Um, to show up at as many health department meetings or sessions that I could so that I have a face to a name for each of the people. And, um, you know, when, when HIPS was speaking out against something the health department did or was having a problem with one of, like, like with the one-for-one, one, for example, or with naloxone access, um, which we just got expanded in D.C. after about three years of, of pretty heavy campaigning, um, you know, like we had a prior relationship that we could we could build on together. Um, the other thing was it was really important for HIPS that um, you know we were solidly delivering on goals that the health department wanted, like making sure that we you know we had access to a population the health department really needed to serve, and we were going to try to make sure that we delivered high quality services so that you know we were kind of seen and were able to be the experts in, in working with the community. Um, I think some of our challenges has been the one-for-one. One. Um, some of this happened when I think health departments who don't necessarily understand, they're not the experts in the syringe exchange. You know, they're experts in a lot of other things, but it's unlikely that if you don't already have a program, you're going to have an expert in what the current public health practice is. And the health department kind of sold one-for-one one to our city council in a way that was kind of unfortunate. Um, because we, we know that it's not considered a best practice now, and um, there are significant challenges that we hear from our clients about having to hold on to syringes and get them back to hips when there's many other ways in the city where we could just train them to dispose of them safely on their own. Um, and so that's been, you know, it's a challenge, and, and it's something that we deal with and we work around as best as we can. Um, one way that we addressed that was our secondary program. We incentivized people, you know, these are basically peers who exchange with their friends or friend networks. We incentivized our, our secondaries on, on disposal as opposed to distribution. Um, and that was one way, because we actually got in trouble our, our, I think our first year, our exchange, our disposal rate was about 60%. Um, and we kind of got in trouble and had to really figure out a way to up that number because we were trying to, like, syringes into the hands of people who are highly, you know, drug users are highly criminalized anyway. Um, drug users who also do sex work and the individuals that we're working with are, are incredibly, like, always under attack by, from police and people were frankly scared to, to rush, scared to have their syringes. Um, I think other challenges, um, one thing our health department did really well is that they handled the communication with law enforcement and we had law enforcement buy-in from the beginning, at least on the higher up level, and that made it okay on the lower levels um, to have syringe exchange happen. We found that that communication needs to be ongoing. Um, what in 2007, when we expanded syringe exchange, our health, like our police department, was super on board. Now we're getting some issues. We're having more clients who are having trouble with officers taking their cards seriously. We've had a couple of prosecutors, um, like move forward with prosecuting people for paraphernalia even though they have a syringe exchange card and those are some issues that we're trying to deal with because after seven, eight years, communication breaks down, not everybody's on the same page. So those were things that I think has really helped 
Um, and we've tried to, again, like this is where ongoing communication, showing up to the meetings, knowing your city council, talking to residents, um, that kind of like just open communication and being non, meeting the community where they're at is, has been really important for us in, in trying to address the hiccups that come along with, with a program like this. Thanks, Cindy. That's great. Um, so in the interest of time, because it's almost ten, um, 10 after 2, um, what I'm going to do is open up, um, Farah's going to coordinate um, the question and answer session, but also as Carrie and Cindy and Chris answer any of the questions that come up, they could also have a, you know, add anything that you think is really important that folks um, might also need to think about that hasn't already been said. So I'm going to hand back to Farah so she can coordinate the Q&A for us and say a huge thank you to our panelists for providing some really rich and relevant um, context and content to add to Kiefer's section around the guidelines um, around accessing you know, the, the approach to getting determination of needs through. So thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Cindy, Chris, and Carrie. That's been that's been great. We have a few questions that will continue um, the conversation. So, Leslie shares that we are a CBO and, and started an SSP just before the this guidance came through. We've asked the Department of Health to certify us, and they have heard nothing from them. What are some recommendations that you might have of what they can do? So, I think this this is one of those areas where. Um, CBOs have to have to you know have a, have a organizing ground game. You know, if your your health department isn't isn't communicating with you the way that you need them to be, um, I, I would encourage you to find ways to to build kind of collective community power and 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 make your voice heard and, and force them to address your concerns and. Um, CPOs, I think I think it's really easy, particularly like when you're meeting an, uh, you're meeting a community need or working with a community that's like you know very disproportionately impacted by all of these different uh, social determinants. That, that the service delivery is is you know what's most important. It's what centers the work. But um, this is why I think we can't forget that uh, we also have to have we have to be organizing. We have to have community power. Um, so this is this is an organizing question, and uh, for what it's worth, Age United does have some capacity to provide um, advocacy and technical assistance around around that kind of organizing. Uh, so I, I encourage you to as well if you wanted to, to reach out and contact me directly. Thanks, Kiefer. Um, Cindy, this question um, comes to you from Laura, who asks, "How did you go about making a policy and making policy and procedure changes um, to be able to support having employees who are?" Um, who are current injecting it or are current injecting drug users? So we were lucky in the sense that we've been, you know, as much as we we've, we've prioritized being a buy and for organization our entire existence, and so I potentially, you know, we potentially had we had employees who were sex workers, we had employees that were drug users, we potentially had injection drug users on staff throughout the 15 years that we were there. So we had to be careful about. You know, at HIPS we try to be really careful about not tokenizing people and not being like, you're the sex worker that HIPS hired or you're the injection drug user. Um, we try to hire and support people based on their strengths, um, on their skill sets and their ability to access the community and to, and to create, you know, things. So we already did not have like a policy against injection drug use at the agency, but that's definitely a culture shift that your organization is going to need to, you know, be aware of. Um, and really quickly, this also reminds me that, like, not – syringe exchange isn't just about handing someone syringes. Um, and if that was the case, then I think more places could do it. Originally, when we expanded our access, we tried to work with a couple of different agencies to, provi to provide exchange services at those agencies, and it ultimately never worked out with the two partners that we tried to have very well because there wasn't buy-in with the staff at the other agencies. There was buy-in potentially from the leadership, but like everybody else was like, no, we don't want your dirty changes in our, in our drop-in. So you really need to make sure that you're, you know, this is an organizational level change and that everybody's on board. Thank you, Cindy. Um, 
A question comes to, do you think treatment facilities are the appropriate agency to offer syringe exchange services? And are there any successful treatment facilities that have done this? And I'll, I'll invite whomever feels comfortable responding. So this is Cindy. Um, so HIPS has done treatment for active users um, in different sorts of ways as we've kind of, not officially, but as we, we've always run, run groups for active users about it. I have seen successful programs where, like harm reduction programs, start doing drug treatment for active users. Um, I think that the, what I have seen, and we're really lucky, DC is part of the DC Recovery Alliance, and we have a treatment community here who is super excited and interested in having harm reduction at the table. Um, and so that is fantastic. That is not necessarily something that I've seen replicated across the country. And my, my concern would be, I think drug treatment programs should absolutely do syringe exchange. Absolutely. They should also do overdose prevention. Um, that is the, I think that the more services are available for people on a continuum uh, is better. Um, my concern is you need to make sure that if you are providing syringe exchange at a drug treatment facility that there's a harm reduction philosophy in place, that it's not being used punitively, and that you have to acknowledge that that goes against kind of your basic well-known 12-step abstinence-based program, and it's challenging, it's challenging to do both. You can do both, um, but you need to make sure you have that harm reduction training and that buy-in at the beginning, or your program's not going to be successful. Add anything? Um, Sarah Miller, if you're still on the line, you shared that the comments that Dr. Lawrence made, that, that Carrie made about barriers in Indiana, really were right on and hit the nail on the head. Um, I would invite you to, um, to share uh, some more if you're able to. But Sarah wanted to just reiterate that there really is no consistency as to what really constitutes an, an epidemic at the local level in Indiana, um, and it's really subjective to the local county health officer. So they, they're significantly restricted in the number of testers that the state will fund, um, and when we try to go outside of funding, to get outside funding to hire other testers, they're advised to get a SEP. Um, I don't know if Kiefer or Dr. Lawrence, you want to respond or, or make any yeah. This is Carrie. Um, I think a couple of things. Um, definitely uh, just to increase the capacity for testing is an ongoing challenge, um, but also figuring out how you're going to have the personnel in order to like really make it what, what I think um, has been described as best practice um, for um, a syringe services program or any kind of harm reduction strategy. So it's great that in our state that it's locally designed to fit the local culture of each community. However, because of the the pieces that have to be put together with to get state approval, um, and again going back to no resources and I mean there's a lot of even hesitancy as far as being able to now draw down any federal money with the, the climate, our political climate in this state, um, we don't foresee any additional resources coming anytime soon. Um, you know, I think that um, it's just, it's been an uphill battle, but saying that, um, you know, Monroe County and our surrounding counties has been really fortunate in having the Indiana Recovery Alliance to kind of help in, but also um, that hasn't been the case everywhere else across the state. And I can tell you more times than not, I've been to other counties who have seen our model here um, in South Central Indiana, and they're like, well, would they be willing to, you know, come up to Northern Indiana? <laughs> and of course, I don't think Chris wants me to offer his services any more than with, with how, he, you know, how he's best serving the counties that he serves. Um, so I think that, you know, they're still, they just don't know what to do. Um, there's a lot of problem solving to be done. Um, and even though they, they, they're trying to get creative, they're also even limited in the, the time and amount of services that they can provide to each community. Um, I know that there's a couple, I think, I believe in um, Wayne County, there's, or, um, yeah, Wayne County, there's only, you know, they're only open two days a week. 
um, and only in the in the like later afternoon evening type hours, um, you know. And I think there's also a little bit of um, I wouldn't say bitterness per se, but a little, you know, there a, little, a lot of these counties are frustrated because of uh, the resources that have been given to the state to Scott. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be those resources given what they're facing, but it has really left the other, you know, 91 counties in Indiana without some of those resources. And that started out early on. I mean, just some of the money that the state gives to aid service organizations, a percentage of that was taken away and reallocated down to Scott. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're looking at the one-stop shop, which in their mind, that's the way it should be. Um, but there's no way they have the capacity locally to do that. Um, so I hope that answers it. It's kind of a long-winded version of an answer. Thanks, Carrie. Um, we have a question from Robert about what are some suggestions for making syringe exchange programs less intimidating for potential participants, especially in small communities where word gets around really quickly and easily? I don't know if, Chris, you wanted to chime in here. Sure, I'd love to. Um, I would say first and foremost, having uh, current IV drug users um, at the syringe exchange is typically the easiest way. Um, also, having we you know we utilize both current and former IV drug users. Probably 90% of the people uh, volunteering and doing outreach work are have some direct experience uh, with IV drug use. Uh, obviously, education on harm reduction outreach can go a long ways. We, you know, within we get people that come in. They're embarrassed. They're pretty sure that it's a sting operation. They think, you know, depending on what drugs they do, that we're doing retinal scans and IDing them later. Um, so what we found, though, is that with that training uh, and with knowing the correct things to say, uh, and when I say the correct things to say, I mean being non-judgmental, being welcoming, letting them know we're not like with a church and we're not with the state and we're not um, trying to necessarily have them get clean unless that is what they want. We wouldn't even use the word clean. Right? Um, so we found that, that all that has been helpful. We also found very early on that we had the same questions coming up again and again and again as to why people didn't feel comfortable coming. So we very quickly put together a frequently asked questions pamphlet. And then we would send that out, send out 10 or 15 copies with every person that came in to give to their friends to let them know uh, that they didn't need to show identification. That was a big one, um, that we weren't tracking them, uh, that they didn't, at, at least for our model, it's a needs-based model, that they didn't have to bring in dirty syringes um, to get clean syringes, uh, that the prosecutor had agreed, in our county at least, to uh, not prosecute if they were caught with those syringes. So it was, a, it was a, a, all of those, I think, together, um, having, again, IV drug users involved in the process having the education uh, to do the outreach, harm reduction outreach, and then listening to people's questions and responding to that. Uh, and if, if I could jump in here too, keeping in mind the concerns right, that Cindy raised around um, having culturally competent staff, this is one of the reasons whenever possible co-locating certain services programs in uh, broader mainstream providers. Um, it helps both normalize the service, but also it, it gives people an excuse to be at a place like, for reasons besides just accessing substance use services. Um, so if that is possible in, in the local community, that could be one um, avenue. So one thing we did, and it was mentioned earlier, was we did a, a homeless a street outreach, similar, similar to what Eggie Hop is doing in uh, the Pacific Northwest. So we, we were offering those services. We were offering blankets. We were offering jackets, socks. Something as simple as having people donate clothes and then offering them is another reason for people to come to our office or to get on uh, to our mobile unit. And then again, yeah, that takes away that stigma. Um, so it's not necessary. And we'll tell people that when they come in, they could very well be volunteers as much as participants. Um, so absolutely offering other services to normalize coming into the office of mobile unit. Thanks. Um, we have one one last question that we see here. If you've got any additional ones, please do submit and submit them in the, in the question pod. 
Um, Laura says, in Oakland, we're working with local medication assist assisted treatment programs to incorporate FSD and overdose prevention pro services. But the challenge is really with regards to shifting the staff's perception and obtaining their buy-in when it comes to integrating harm reduction-based services into substance abuse treatment programs. I know Kiefer wants to weigh in here, and, and if anyone wants to share as well, anyone else. Yeah, and you know, and I think that's right. That's the golden question: is, is how do we how how do we integrate a, a rights-based model, a participant-based model, into a healthcare system that at times struggles to to, to work in that in that capacity and in that environment? Um, and so, I, I don't I don't have like a great perfect answer here, but I think that that's not a, that that's not an uncommon um, problem to have as, as we're looking to integrate services programs into broader healthcare systems, and it's something that, uh, but it's also something the country is going to have to find a way to do, because the, with the opiate epidemic continuing to get worse, with, um, you know, funding structures changing, to the, the syringe services programs are, are offering a really integral uh, linkage to care avenue for people to access health care services and it's we will be doing a disservice I think to some of the most vulnerable people in our communities if we're not able to find ways to provide those, those broader medical services and recovery services um, as a part of our, our syringe service outreach. This is Emma. I think, yeah, and just to add to what Keith is saying, I think it's really making sure that, you know, wherever you're incorporating harm reduction services or just harm reduction approaches, um, you know, here at the Harm Reduction Coalition, we've sat in a lot of rooms um, over the, very recently, but over the years, where we've, people have, we've had to support people to go through that paradigm shift because their concept or what they think their understanding of harm reduction might not actually what it be what true harm reduction is. So in order to kind of create their ability to have that buy-in, they really do need very good cultural competency training in what syringe exchange actually means. Otherwise, they, can, they either don't buy-in at all they dismiss it or they misuse it to just remain hinged on a very abstinence-only approach. Um, and I know Chris and Carrie and I have sat in rooms in Indiana recently and watched people go through that paradigm shift. And often people that really struggle with it, once they've gone through it and they truly get it, can become really good champions of it. Um, so it's really key that you know, in your local areas, if people are beginning to adopt this, they have had the right kind of cultural competency training in what harm reduction actually means so that they can integrate it appropriately. Yeah, and, and I'd like to just reiterate a little bit and highlight, to some of those. Um, I mean, I really think, I don't think Indiana would be as far along as it has been able to without having um, the Harm Reduction Coalition as a strong partner. Um, because I think I've at least witnessed some pretty transformative experiences of community members. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, just having someone who's the expert come in, because even with a meeting that we had in Scott County, um, to kind of really educate the community, because everything was so top down and so fast. I mean, it was, I, I sometimes, refer to it as um, it was like basically an emerg the emergency response to a natural disaster coming in where you have FEMA and all these government entities telling you what to do and saying you need this and this and this, but not really allowing there to be any kind of learning. <laughs> you're, just, you're just complying. Um, and so even there, they were the community members were struggling about the purpose and really the benefit of prep shop and the syringe exchange. And so having that ongoing conversation and really developing this public narrative around what harm reduction is, what it means, and how it benefits your community, um, I think has, has been a huge help. And, um, you know, we even had local officials kind of help to co-facilitate that. So um, I think that that's a key factor, at least, that I can attribute to some of the successes that we've had. Because really, I, I think that they, our syringe exchange 
Syringe exchange in Indiana was, in a way, if you were to look at it from a fishbowl, the way even just the policy was written with no, no kind of resources or clear guidance for folks, um, you know, there's a lot of miss, a, a, lot, a lot of the conversation around enabling um, and some really negative context. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that's made a pretty, that's kind of driven some, a lot of the transformation we're seeing here locally. Thanks, Carrie, um, and really thank you, Cindy, Chris, um, Emma, for that really um, informative discussion and for sharing all the experience and resources that you each have. Um, Carrie, you mentioned Harm Reduction Coalition as a, as, a, as a partner and a tremendous partner and asset in Indiana. Additional resources include, obviously, AIDS United's Capacity Building Assistance Program, um, and we're able to and prepared to offer technical assistance and trainings on some of the topics that we're that were covered in today's webinar. I think Kifra and Emma both referenced those, um, as well as in a variety of other topics. Um, I really want to encourage you to reach out to us via email um, at SIBA at aidsunited.org or by phone to talk to us about how we can, um, how we can partner and support the work that you do. Um, we wanted to leave you with some additional resources um, some that are, are linked here, including the World Health Organization's Guide to Starting and Managing Needle and Syringe Exchange Programs, um, and the Centers for Disease, Disease Control um, SSP Guidance website. It offers a variety of resources there, as well as links to other, other ones. So um, I think that's a, that's an, a, a useful site. Um, of course, reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to Harm Reduction Coalition and, and AU to find out more also about our syringe Access Fund grant making initiative um, to find out more about our advocacy and policy um, ability and technical assistance that we can offer to you. Um, we are coming to the end, and I wanted to just make this pitch again for our July 14th webinar, um, which is focused on um, looking at the rules for, for 501c3 is engaging in, in policy and advocacy, especially when it comes to um, and, and in the 2016 election work. Um, I'm racing through and I really appreciate everyone's time. I know we're a few minutes over. I wanted to make the last call for if there are no additional questions, we want to thank everyone.